They're dangerous, tough, mean, and powerful. For nearly a century, trucks have helped build our world. These are the biggest, the best, the fastest. If being tailgated by a 40-ton semi on the interstate is your worst nightmare, then imagine this. This is the largest truck on Earth. This gigantic dump truck weighs over 200 tons. It's used to haul 320 tons of rock in open cast mining. It's 24 feet high and 27 feet wide and carries 1,200 gallons of diesel. It needs power steering because the tires alone are over 12 feet high. There are 25 of these trucks around the world. They're shipped in parts because they're way too big for any highway to handle. Since the Second World War, over 50 million trucks have been built in the United States alone. Almost all the goods we use are at some stage transported by these giants of the road. Many other trucks work off-highway, each designed for a specific job. They cope with the toughest conditions and the most inhospitable environments. These trucks are the workhorses of industry. They're built to be tough, and they're built to last. But there are people who use trucks for something entirely different. Patrick Bourny from France drives these crazy trucks. Steve Murty from Britain specializes in a different kind of truck madness. He has the record for the longest ever wheelie in a truck, an unbeaten quarter of a mile. But it's tough to beat your own record. Steve also drives a much more powerful truck. 
This one has a 24,000 horsepower jet engine. It can reach 150 miles per hour in under a quarter of a mile. It's the fastest truck in Europe. But the fastest truck in the world is the Shockwave. This truck is powered by three Pratt & Whitney J48 jet engines, producing an incredible 36,000 horsepower. At full thrust, they develop four times more power than an F-14 jet fighter. Kent Shockley and his father built the truck from the ground up. Any other truck would simply disintegrate under the pressure. Basically everything's custom built, hand built. It's designed to go fast. We run this thing 300 miles an hour about five times a week and we've been doing this for 14 years and I don't think there's another vehicle out there that can do that, has done that and will ever do that. Shockwave has been engineered to overcome its poor aerodynamics with sheer brute force. It's 300 times more powerful than the average family car. The jet engines burn diesel because it's less volatile than jet fuel. The truck burns 400 gallons every mile. Perfect tires are critical. These tires are first x-rayed for imperfections and then shaved to an eighth of an inch thick. We should take about 80 pounds of rubber off the tire because at 300 miles an hour, the tire is spinning 2200 RPM. So we want to take as much weight off the outside of the tire as possible. We don't want to pop a tire at 300 miles an hour. Kent prepares himself for his second run of the day. You're in a car suit, you're buckled in, you got all that power behind you, 36,000 horsepower, and you know when you push that button you're going for a ride. In 1992, Shockwave broke the land speed record for trucks. It reached 376 miles per hour. We've held it for five years, and if somebody decides to break it and does break it, uh, we'll modify the truck and uh, take it back from them if we have to. Today, the Shockwave has been performing at the Salinas, California Air Show. And as a finale, Kent has challenged this stunt plane to a race. Put her to bed, which is in the black trailer here. Uh, I don't quite give her a kiss, but I give her a little love tap and uh, tell her I'll see you tomorrow.
To cover events like air shows for television, you need a huge mobile control room. This is the Darth Vader, the most expensive truck and trailer in the world. It's worth seven million dollars. The 53-foot trailer expands to provide seating for up to 30 technicians who control the latest state-of-the-art digital television equipment. The trailer is pulled by a brand new Kenworth T2000. The whole rig has to have a special permit because it's 75 feet. It's three feet longer than any other truck on American roads. Also at 45 tons, it needs a skillful driver. The T2000's regular driver is Sam Rackham, and he's very proud of his truck. It's an easy truck to drive. It's a little long, but you get used to it. Some people think it looks like a Dodge truck on steroids. But, uh, you know, you live with what you have, and I'm very, very happy with it. The aerodynamic styling is designed to increase fuel efficiency, and the 12-liter engine is computer-controlled. Anything goes wrong with it, they just plug the laptop computer into it and punch in the keyboard, and they find the problem quite amazing to me being an old truck driver that there's no wrenches or screwdrivers anymore. With this piece of equipment going down the road draws a lot, a lot of attention. Everybody wants to know what it is. They're coming by you and they'll, they'll slow down and, uh, and look at the truck and the trail and everything. They're really, really attracted to it. Really an eye-catching piece of machinery. I think I've got the best job in the world. The New York Fire Department relies on two different kinds of trucks. There are fire engines which pump water, and there are trucks which carry ladders. Ladder 5, based in Greenwich Village, Manhattan, is one of the most extreme. It's called a tiller truck. The reason we have a tiller truck in uh, the, the village is because they have very narrow streets. Despite its size, the truck is the most maneuverable truck we have. It's 54 feet long, but it can make hairpin turns. It can go in and out of traffic. The back can swing out, so instead of flipping, you know, like a hydrant or a parked car, we can swing it out either to the right or left, and it gives us uh, clearance. The tiller man at the back of the truck steers the rear wheels, making sure that they follow the same line as the front of the truck. If we encounter like a tight right hand turn, I would try to square the cab section and he would counter that move by swinging out to the left and then cutting it hard back to the right, which would bring the tiller section in line with the cab. Ladder 5 carries a 100 foot ladder. It is manned by a crew of six and supervised by a fire officer. Our responsibilities in the truck is to uh, enter, vent, and search. We provide access to the building, we vent the building, and we search for life. We take uh, calculated risks. Of course, there are procedures that we're supposed to follow to ensure our safety, but uh, it's a dangerous job, and sometimes you get hurt. The Ladder 5 crew pride themselves in maintaining a response time of less than four minutes to any emergency. To do this, they have to move fast, and that's where the tiller truck excels. The truck makes things seem a lot easier because it's, uh, it's a marvelous machine, actually. It just makes our job a lot more efficient. For this area, there's no substitute. This time, they've been called out to investigate smoke escaping from a basement of an apartment building. Hey, 
The smoke is coming from an oil-fueled boiler, which has caught fire. They turn off the fuel supply, vent the smoke. This one was an easy job. Back in the truck, and there's another call. Details come through of a man drowning in the Hudson River. Speed is critical. Traffic sometimes is a problem. Sometimes they don't see this big truck. That horns blaring, lights flashing. And sometimes the motorists, they don't yield. They claim they don't see you, so uh, you just got to be careful out there and have your wits about you. It's not just fires that we respond to, we uh, respond to emergency situations. We just try to, in general, to uh, you know, help the community out. This is just hitting the bottom. Man. You guys all right? Yeah, I'm good. Watch your back, watch your back. coming down. The man is alive and is taken to the hospital. Ladder 5 covers only a square mile, but the tiller truck is called out on average 10 times a day. This truck is an essential part of New York's fire protection service. This apparatus is uh, specially designed for working in this uh, community. We can't do without it, so they gave us something different uh, and said, drive it. I guess we would have to make do, but it would not be the same. If we couldn't have this truck, I would probably uh, put my papers in for retirement. One of the biggest challenges for a fire truck is an airplane in flames. Chicago O'Hare is one of the busiest airports in the world. A plane is on the move here every 30 seconds. And if there's an emergency, it could be anywhere in an area of 12 square miles. The airport fire rescue team is required by law to reach the scene in under three minutes. But that's no problem with these specialized crash trucks, which can travel at up to 80 miles per hour. They bring water and foam to a stricken aircraft in seconds. Each truck carries over 3,000 gallons of water and 420 gallons of foam. The turrets can pump out their entire load in less than four minutes. Basically, the job of that apparatus is to knock down as much fire as quickly as it can. Our main objective, amongst all other things that are happening, is to make sure that anybody that's on that aircraft can escape and not burn up when they get out. They're going to try, first of all, to cut a path to the doors of the aircraft to cover the people that are trying to get out. These trucks might one day save your life.
without all this equipment coming with all of the water and all of the foam that they carry without that we might as well not be here that's the most important thing on this airport Dennis Jaworski is a dedicated trucker who has become fascinated by the history of trucks. He's built up a collection of over 200 classic vehicles that span almost a century of truck building. As a young boy, 12, 14 years old, my brother and I started collecting old cars. Then in the early 60s, we realized no one was doing anything about the old trucks. So we started a collection of old trucks. Dennis's family has been in the trucking business for over two generations. Well, my mom and dad basically started the business in 1930. My dad would be out doing political stuff, and uh, he would leave the dump truck back home in the gravel bank, and my mother would be loading it by hand. She probably put more loads into that truck than my dad did. I can get in it and remember riding with my dad. And the first time I got into that 36 Ford dump truck, I didn't think the world could get any bigger. Since then, Dennis has spent most of his time restoring trucks and rescuing them from a rusty grave. Some really need a lot of love when we get them. It usually would take about a year to totally restore a truck. You can buy them restored cheaper than doing it yourself. A lot of people tell me you must love old trucks. I say, no, I love my wife and children. I like old trucks. The very first trucks were used only for local deliveries inside the city because they weren't powerful or tough enough for the rough country roads. The first truck was built by the Daimler Company in Germany in 1896. A few years later, the American truck building industry was established. But it wasn't until World War I that the truck really proved its worth. This 1917 Packard is the oldest truck in Dennis Jaworski's collection. It has the original solid rubber tires. Inflatable pneumatic tires, which gave a much more comfortable ride, weren't invented until one year later. Dennis prefers driving his 1953 LTL, which he has restored to its original glory. It's a West Coast truck, a lot more fancy than what we have on the East Coast here. I guess they had a lot higher taste out there than us New Englanders had. But Dennis's favorite is this chain drive Mac FK, built in 1932. At the time, chain drive trucks open cab was going out, but Mac still made these trucks with a die-hard New England contractor that wouldn't give up chain drive and open cab. So that tells you quite a lot about a New England. The average thing to do today is when you're done with something, cut it up, scrap it, junk it. These trucks built America and when you're driving it down the road, you can say, my goodness, this truck might have built this road. All truckers expect their machines to give them years of unfailing service. Mack trucks have built themselves a reputation of solid reliability. Durability is very important. Trucks see a, see a wide range of applications. Uh, you know, we haul 80,000 pounds and some applications 90, 200 to 300,000 pounds. There's many trucks that have run to a million miles hauling very heavy loads in very rough terrain before they need any major overhauls. It is important to have that durability to provide a cost-effective truck for our customers.
So we do do an extensive amount of testing, et cetera, to our vehicles to maintain the durability. This is the chassis bump roll test, which simulates driving down a road at 10 miles per hour, hitting potholes on each alternate wheel. The test lasts 50 hours and is a serious challenge to anything mounted onto the chassis. This simulator uses hydraulics to test the driver's cab. It's controlled by a computer and recreates the vibrations of average cruising speed. This bump machine simulates the vertical impact that a truck can experience off-road. And in this controlled environmental chamber, they can take the temperature from minus 20 degrees to 110 degrees Fahrenheit and vary the airspeed from zero to 60 miles per hour. They can simulate anything from the frozen Arctic to the driest desert and test the truck's air conditioning and heating systems in the most hostile conditions. Noise and vibration tests are performed in an echo-free sound chamber. Here they can analyze and then improve the design of the vehicle and also identify any sources of audible noise which could create driver fatigue. He spends many hours in the vehicle. If you put him in a position where he isn't comfortable, he fatigues earlier. So we have to design a truck that you know rides good, handles good. The controls are at a good location for him where he's not straining himself throughout the operation of the vehicle. Finally, the complete truck is put through its paces on the test track. Truck manufacturers are also required to build trucks that stand up to the strictest safety standards. Driver safety is always critical on the road. It's even more so on the racetrack. This is truck racing a European sport that keeps its spectators on the edge of their seats. For safety, there's a speed limit of 100 miles per hour, so the skill is in overtaking on the corners. The trucks aren't built specially for racing. They're all adapted from road-going vehicles and engineered for acceleration rather than ultra-high speed. Steve Parrish has been number one in the World Championships five times in the last seven years, and he's used to the rough and tumble of the racetrack. It isn't as bad as you first think. We have special race roll bars and very stiff chassis, and it actually handles reasonably well. There's still an enormous amount of weight there, and it doesn't do exactly as you ask it, but it's much more precise than you would imagine a truck could possibly be. His truck is a top-of-the-line Mercedes, that has been customized for racing. It's basically a 12-litre V6 engine, which in a road truck 
produces, I think, about 450 horsepower. The technicians and engineers work miracles with it and get it up to something like 1,250 horsepower. And I can tell you that is very, very impressive, not only to, to watch, but to drive. It goes from zero to 100 in 9.6 seconds. Keeping all that power in check means that there's a tremendous buildup of heat in the disc brakes. So water is sprayed directly onto the discs to stop them from overheating. We use something in the region of uh, 85 litres of water during a 30 minute race, so it actually sprays a lot of water in. If the water runs out, the brakes wouldn't last more than one lap. After half an hour's racing, there was only 20 seconds between the finishing time of the first and the last truck. In this qualifying race, Steve has come in fifth, which places him fifth in line for today's final. After each race, the truck is weighed. There's a minimum weight limit of five tons to prevent the trucks from being rebuilt with lighter, more expensive metals. Information from each run is downloaded onto a computer. From this, the team can analyze the engine temperature and pressure, the G-forces, the suspension, and of course, Steve's performance around the corners. The teams are given one hour to prepare the trucks for the final. Driving such a huge piece of machinery around a racetrack requires particular skill, especially when there is so little space to overtake. Steve credits his racing success to his smooth driving technique. I call it tiptoeing my way round because if you grab hold of it and start heaving it around, you go nowhere because there is so much inertia. The tyres get overheated, the brakes get overheated. You really have to be very careful with it. Even changing gear is a specialized technique. I have a choice. I can either use the paddles, which the green one is the up arrow for upshifting, and the red one's for downshifting, so that's very simple. Or if I, uh, I want to, I can use the stick shifter, but it's much easier. There's no gate or anything like that. It's just forward for faster and back for lower gear. They don't look like they should be going as fast as they are, and it's a five-ton vehicle that's doing 100 miles an hour sideways through a corner with smoke off the tyres. It's very, very spectacular. Unusually for Steve Parrish, this race has been a disaster. He suffered some serious damage to the truck and fallen back to sixth place. I'm a, an awfully bad loser. I just don't accept it, I really don't. But I hate to blame myself because once the race driver starts to blame himself, he's nearly finished, he's lost his confidence and that's very, very important to be a racing driver. Steve has been racing trucks since the sport began in the early 80s. At that time, the trucks were either driven by truck drivers with no racing experience, or like Steve, racing drivers with no truck driving experience. It was all a great recipe for entertainment. And over the years, there have been some spectacular incidents.
The Dutch also love truck racing. The only problem is that there's a shortage of racetracks in Holland, so they race on the beach at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour. These oversized beach buggies are customized road trucks running on tires built for desert conditions. Most of the drivers have gained their experience of this kind of terrain in the Paris to Dakar rallies. there is one race that tests a truck like no other. The Baja 1000 is one of the most grueling challenges a truck can face. In this annual race, the contenders have just 24 hours to complete the rugged 1,000 mile course. In 1996, this truck was the largest vehicle ever to run the Baja. Wild Thing is a Class 8 off-road racing truck and was one of the fastest machines on the course. It had a custom-built suspension to withstand the harsh pounding of the terrain and ran on a 370 horsepower engine fueled by diesel which gave the truck more power at lower speeds. It traveled at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour and overtook 60 other entrants in the first two hours. But this test of endurance was a walk in the park compared to the extraordinary journey made by four trucks that set out from Rome in 1995. This expedition was the first ever to circumnavigate the world by truck. The Italian Iveco Truck Company wanted to prove that their trucks could stand the test. Over the harsh winter months, the four Turbostar trucks traveled through some of the most inhospitable areas of the world. The vehicles were standard road trucks, but fitted with specially designed tires and a separate heater to prevent the diesel from freezing. Driving across Siberia, trucks and drivers were subjected to temperatures of minus 40 degrees. It was an epic test of both human and mechanical endurance. When they reached the Bering Straits, the plan was to drive the vehicles right across the ice, but an early thaw forced them to be airlifted instead. The second half of their journey took them across the Arctic, proving that these trucks were capable of enduring the harshest conditions on Earth. The expedition arrived in New York four months after they had begun their epic journey. They had traveled 20,000 miles. In Australia, trucks have to travel long distances across rough country on a daily basis. In the outback, the towns are so far apart, they use a special kind of truck. Several trailers are joined together to make one long road train. The roads across the outback are straight and empty, perfect for monster vehicles. 
Here there are few railroads, and only these giant trucks visit the remote mines and farms. Valuable resources are carried by road train from the center of the country to the more populated cities on the coast. It's not surprising it's an Australian mining company that operates the longest truck in the world. This is the custom-built 3B, affectionately known as the Centipede. It's a 205-ton, 160-foot-long rig. It has an 18-speed gearbox with a 550-horsepower engine and carries over a ton of fuel. It has 110 wheels on 28 axles. The centipede transports zinc ore from a mine in the Northern Territories to a port hundreds of miles away. It works 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in one year, it can haul a quarter of a million tons of ore. Australians have come to rely heavily on these amazing machines. And there are plans for even longer road trains in the future. The mining company is so pleased with the performance of the centipede that they have built another one. Now there are two identical longest trucks in the world. But a truck doesn't have to be long to carry large loads. This building weighs 1,790 tons and is 75 feet high. It's sitting on top of one of the most unusual trucks ever built. The Mammoth Company specializes in transporting huge loads. People come and they walk next to something that we're going to move and just say, that's impossible, can't be done, but we can usually do it. They achieve the impossible by using self-propelled modular transporters. These units can be joined together in a variety of configurations, depending on the weight and size of the load. All the wheels can turn 360 degrees, together or separately. So the transporters can drive forward or backwards, sideways, diagonally, even in a circle. Everything comes back to just a single point of control. So one person can operate the system, whether there's one module or a hundred modules. I've worked with a variety of transport systems in my time, but I've never come across anything quite as clever as this. In Malaysia, transporting a 500-ton gas tank 15 miles was one of their more spectacular projects. This gigantic load was hauled by just one driver. He has a control box in front of him with two joysticks on, and the signals from those joysticks through a series of computers provide the propulsion, the steering, and the jacking up and down of the system. It took a whole day, but the 165-foot-long tank finally reached the port where it was loaded onto a ship. This was big but they can carry even bigger loads. The modular concept and the way that it can be expanded really means that there isn't a limit. American truckers love their trucks, care for them like sweethearts, 
and take them to shows to show them off. One of these proud truck owners is Todd Job, who lovingly cares for his Peterbilt 379. I do this because of the, the fun, the people that you meet, and I want my truck to look shiny. For me, it's just the pride of owning it. If I'm not either working, sleeping, doing paperwork, I'm polishing. I'm pretty much just doing this as a hobby, still getting to play, but still making money, do what I want to do. Todd hauls for a private trucking company and travels thousands of miles in his truck. What I like about trucking the most is the freedom, not somebody looking over your shoulders. You get to do what you want to do as long as you make your deliveries and pickups on time. Right now I'm having a lot of fun. Todd's tender loving care for his truck finally paid off this year. He won the biggest truck honor there is Best of show at the Shell Super Rig Contest. I was very excited. One of the goals I had when I started doing the truck was to get on the Shell Super Rig calendar. I'm trying to make a name, get my truck known. It's starting to come around. Many trucks around the world are now run on diesel fuel, which provides more power and better fuel economy. But there's a great pressure on the truck industry to produce a more environmentally friendly vehicle that can do the job just as efficiently. Radical solutions will have to be found because it's estimated that by the year 2000, 900 billion ton miles of freight will be moved each year by trucks in the US alone. One solution could be Volvo's environmental concept truck, the ECT. It has been specifically designed to minimize air pollution in cities. It's powered by a gas turbine, like a helicopter, which in turn drives an electric motor. When only minimum power is required, all surplus energy is diverted to batteries for storage. The idea is that you can run at very low emissions using the gas turbine engine pure and simple and then when you get into the city centre you can switch to battery mode which of course is zero emission. This turbine is run on ethanol but ECT could run on any liquid fuel or natural gas. Another advantage is that it's very quiet which helps to reduce noise pollution in urban areas. It's almost like a spacecraft because you just get the whine of the engine going through. You don't get any of the normal noise you would expect with an engine and a gearbox from today's conventional truck. The body of the truck is made from aluminum instead of steel. It's much lighter and it's easier to recycle. The ECT also has front and rear wheel steering which allows for easy handling. You can in fact park by just engaging the sideways steering action and the vehicle will crab sideways in alongside the curb. The reality is that ECT may never be manufactured as a production vehicle, but many of the ideas and technologies that it explores will be incorporated in trucks in the next millennium. Although the design of the truck may change over time, it will always be an indispensable workhorse. Tough, reliable, durable, and strong enough to move mountains.